start off a message, isn't it? You're looking at that? Uh, it's good to be here this morning. Is everybody all right? Was that a great worship service or what? Was great? Uh, let's put our hands together for our pastors, Ken and Kathy, this morning. Um, pastor has been teaching on all of me all of this month, and uh, I actually asked him if I could have this last Sunday <clears throat> to preach on, to teach on Black History Month, um, and I want to commend him. Um, I love this guy. He's a real guy, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and he, he relinquished. He, he uh, allowed me to do so, so I really appreciate you for, 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 for that. Um, I said in the earlier service that this was not, and all of the sermons that I've prepared, teachings that I've prepared, this was not an easy one to prepare for. This was not an easy one to prepare for. Because um, if I had a chip on my shoulder, then I can come from the far left and preach angry. <laughs> um, if I was unconcerned, then I wouldn't do it at all. And so to come down the middle and to talk about this Black History Month and its origin, um, it took a lot of grace. And um, I don't know about you, but Pastor, he kind of helps us out, the pastors that, that teach up here. He says, we, you, should, you should, you know, you should um, teach your message to yourself or to your family. Sit your family down before you actually teach it on Sunday. Run it by them, you know, kind of kind of get it out. And, and, and I, I tried that, and my wife was, was laying in the bed last night, and I was trying to teach her, and she was like, yeah, that's pretty good. No, no, just kidding. No, just kidding. No, just kidding. No, no, no. She, she helped me out. She helped me out a lot, as, as she always, as she always does. Um, but he, he's amazing. He's masterful at it because he sends us his notes every Saturday night. He remembers every last word of his notes, and I don't know how he does it. Therefore, I will be reading off the sheet today, just so you know. Uh, so, but I'm working on it, man. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. So, so like I said, um, are we family? Are we family here today? Are we, are we serious? Are we family? And even to those who are visiting for the first time, we want you to know that you are family today. We love you. We love you. And if you don't know me, I'm just a little bit crazy. No, 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 no. But I like to, I like to kind of make the main thing the main thing and come right down the middle. So, as I said, uh, a lot of what will be covered today ain't necessarily easy to talk about. You, you understand what I'm saying? Um, our American history uh, has so many things to, to praise, uh, but at the same time, uh, it, it kind of causes you to kind of hang your head when you look at certain things, and I just want to kind of cover some things. Um, February, Black History Month, um, it has uh, polarized a lot of America. Some people uh, care less <laughs> about Black History Month, uh, and then there are others who feel like there's not enough done uh, within that month in our school systems and within your families and the whole thing. Um, uh, as an as a, as a African-American race, a lot of our history had been erased. Uh, on the books, so we had to depend on oral history, uh, the stories that your father told, that his father told, that his father told, so th those type of things. Um, there's a wonderful documentary, um, uh, it was on PBS, it's called The African Americans, Many Rivers to Cross, and it is a six-part series, phenomenal. It's taught by Henry Gates, uh, Professor Henry Gates, and it's a phenomenal uh, a documentary, and it gives us a great uh, account of our history. So I kind of want to share that today. Um, so I'm glad you all are here. I want you to understand something. Black history is not just about black folk. Do y'all know that? 
<laughs> if it were Martian history, that'd be a different thing, right? But it's not because we don't interact with Martians, at least as far as we know. No, <laughs> but, but we interact with each other. So it can't just be black history and not concerned with anything else. It is, it is really our history, to be, to be totally honest. But let me give you some, some background to why black history even exists. It started off as Negro History Week. It wasn't even Black History Month. It was Negro History Week. And it was a, uh, 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 a man by the name of Carter Woodson. He was an African-American historian, author, journalist, uh, and he's, he's, he's been dubbed as the father of black history, who decided that we needed to know more about ourselves through our history. Uh, and enough was not taught. So therefore, if you don't know who you are, you will not know what your future is like. If you don't know where you came from, you really don't know where you're going. Huh? And I feel like today, much of what we see is a result of not knowing our history. So it's important to share our history, oral or otherwise. Carter Woodson says it like this. He says, if a race has no history, it has no worthwhile tradition. It becomes a negligible factor in the thought of the world, and it stands in danger of being exterminated. So Negro History uh, Week began in 1926. It was the second week of February, and it coincided with uh, the birthdays of Abraham Lincoln and uh, Frederick Douglass, uh, for obvious reasons. Um, it began uh, only in North Carolina, Delaware, West Virginia, Baltimore, and D.C. And at the launch, Woodson contended that the teaching of black history was essential to ensure the physical and intellectual survival of our race within broader society. So it grew in popularity throughout the following decades, and certain mayors across the country endorsed it as a holiday. So Black History Month actually began because of a student body at Kent State um, University in, in February of uh, 1969. Uh, they presented it and wanted to become a much larger uh, thing. So that following year, 1970, um, it became a month-long celebration uh, where they were. And then in 1976, as part of the United States Bicentennial, uh, Black History Month was officially recognized by President Gerald Ford and the United States uh, government. Uh, so that's how Black History came into, into play. And, and what he wanted to do was teach students, not, listen to me, not just little black kids, but little white kids, little Hispanic kids, little Asian kids, about blacks in America. There is no other race in America that was brought over here in chains. No other group of people. Many other groups have suffered, the, the, the Jews have suffered tremendous atrocities, and many other have suffered and gone through, but no other race was brought over here uh, in chains and, and, and subjected to uh, hundreds of years of, of slavery. And it's important to begin to share that history with uh, all kids, particularly little black kids. Let me tell you why. If I don't understand where I come from and I don't understand uh, the contributions that my race has made to society, then I'll never understand my true worth. I'm lost in the dark. I'm kind of feeling around. I don't quite know what it is that I contribute. So in other words, if I realize that my black ancestors were inventors and scientists and so on and so forth, then now I can realize that I can do the same thing. Huh? So therefore, if you hold back my history, you're also holding back my future. So I have to know what has taken place before me and how my ancestors, ancestors conducted themselves in the face of adversity. You get that? All right. Uh, 1 John 4.20 says it this way in the NIV. It says, whoever claims 
To love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Uh-oh. So whoever does not love their brother and sister who they see every day, work with, interact with, you can't love God, the one who you haven't seen. Huh? Because yeah, it's easy to say, oh, God, I love you so much. <laughs> Jesus, I love you so much. And then uh, a Latino walks in and you go, hmm. Or a white guy works, walks in and you go, hmm. Father's saying, whoa, 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 whoa. I thought you loved me so much. Oh, I do love you. I love you. I love you. Him? Not so much. And the father's saying, but that is me. Huh? That is me. That black guy, that white guy, that Latino woman, that, that Asian child, that is me. Right? If we are all born from the father, then we all look like him. Which ends the debate of what color is God? He's all colors. Huh? Um, so of all my children, I used to get upset when they said, uh, oh, Dorian looks just like his mama. I'm like, no, he don't. He look like me. And then Kennedy came along. Boy, she looked just like her mama. I'm like, man. And then Jordan comes along. She looks like me. And my wife says, no, she doesn't. Oh, yes, she does. If you saw my mother, if you saw my mother, you'd see little Jordan. Uh, but see, each one of them have a different characteristic of me and their mother. And that's just, I mean, one, that just blows your mind, right? When you look at like, oh, that's a little of her. And, that's, and, then, and then not just how they look, but how they act. Huh? When they're really bad, that's all her. That is all her. You handle them. You deal with them kids. <laughs> right now, I'm just an uncle, but you know I'm just kidding. Uh, but, but that's what it is. So, so if I went on to have several children, watch this now. If Anissa and I went on to have several children, no matter how many we had, all of them have something from us. Uh, I promised myself that I would not perpetuate the black sheep mentality in my family because I saw it perpetuated in, within my siblings. There are five of us, right? And sure enough, the middle one, my, my, my oldest brother, Frankie, he had a whole lot of issues. And so as soon as, soon as we see that, right, I'm the youngest of five. And so as soon as we see that, we go, man, yeah, there's, there's a black sheep mentality. And I'm going, man, that's, that's crazy. So I didn't want to do that with, with my kids. So Kennedy is, is in the middle, right? And just the other day, uh, Jordan was in the room. And I come in there, and she was talking to my wife. She was like, I think Daddy likes Kennedy more than she, he likes me. And I was like, what? Who told you that? Absolutely not. I love every last one of my kids, but I promise I wouldn't have any black sheep. Right? So sometimes you need to place just a little bit more attention and affection on that middle one so you don't have to deal with that black sheep. Look at that for a second. Black sheep? Seriously? No, no, no. I'm serious. Listen to me. Listen to me, because I'm going to get to it in a minute. Do you know that words have played such a huge part in us knowing who we are as black folk? You've heard it said before. If you look in the dictionary, so much was ascribed to the word black, and it was all negative pretty much. Think about it. Black sheep. Black Friday. Black Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Watch it, watch it now. But what we are looking at is a, a systematization of prejudice and racism that, has, uh, that our country was even birthed in. And if we don't watch it, if we don't know our history, then we are destined to what? Thank you very much. So, have we made progress? Have we? Have we made progress? Absolutely. I, I think we've made progress. Let me, let me give you a little history. Um, 
1619, the first Negro slave landed on our shores um, of this nation from African soil. Slavery was all about free labor, but it was dehumanizing. It aided in the production of such lucrative crops as tobacco, rice, indigo. In 1641, slavery was legalized. In 1660, King Charles of England established, King Charles II of England established the Royal African Company, calling Africans black gold because slave labor became so profitable. African Americans helped build the economic foundations of this new nation, but it tore apart families, plunging the human spirit into a dark pit of despair for centuries to come. The invention of the cotton gin in 1793 solidified slavery's importance in the South's economy. In 1787, slavery is made illegal in the Northwest Territory, <clears throat> but the U.S. Constitution states that Congress may not ban the slave trade until 1808, where Congress bans slaves importation from Africa. The Dred Scott decision of 1857, the Supreme Court said in essence that the Negro, bound or free, was not a citizen, therefore could not sue in federal court uh, or hold precedence. Then, moving up to 1861, as the West expanded and the abolition movement grew, a debate over slavery would throw this nation into a bloody American Civil War. In 1863, President Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation declaring that all persons held as slaves within the Confederate States are and henceforth shall be free. 1865, right about to 1877, were the Reconstruction years. And if you don't know anything about this, I, I really encourage you to uh, research this. The Reconstruction years were pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Uh, when you look at it, we, we come out of slavery, and then for the next nine years or so, um, you had um, <clears throat> uh, black towns, and you had blacks being elected to uh, uh, official status and, and Congress and, and what have you. And um, it was it was pretty it was pretty interesting. And 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 um, there were there were places in Oklahoma and, and whatnot that had these very affluent towns. As a matter of fact, it was called. Um, uh, Black Wall Street, uh, considered Black Wall Street in Oklahoma, and it was, it was, really, it was really good. Although they were little microcosms of, of, of the world, they had to kind of stick to themselves. Um, and and the, the, the black dollar turned over about 26 times before it actually left their city. So it was doing pretty good, but it didn't last long. It didn't last long, and about 1877, um, it all ended. Um, 1868, 14th Amendment, Meant basically nullifies the Dred, Dred Scott case, which had ruled that blacks were not citizens. 1870, the 15th Amendment gives blacks the right to vote, but it wouldn't happen for a while. 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson. <clears throat> Supreme Court decision for a separate but equal was upheld until 1956, subjecting blacks to 60 years of Jim Crow. <clears throat> 1946, although African Americans had Participated in every major U.S. war, it was not until after World War II that President Harry S. Truman issued an executive order integrating the U.S. armed forces. And then moving up to 1955, the civil rights movement is emboldened by the public outrage over young Emmett Till's brutal murder. That very same year, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat, and in response to her arrest, a year-long bus boycott is successful in the desegregation of buses. Does anybody know who Claudette Colvin is? Does anybody know who Claudette Colvin is? <clears throat> Thank you, I see them hands. Young people raising their hands. Give it up for young people. <clears throat> Claudette Colvin was the first Rosa Parks. Problem was, she was an unwed mother and she was young, seven, about 17 years old. And one day, coming home on the bus, she decides, I'm not gonna move, I'm gonna sit right here. And the story goes, the early stages of the NAACP could not uh, you really use her as the face because they felt her credibility would be tarnished, obviously, you know, because of her condition. But just a few months later, um, 
young lady by the name of Rosa Parks decides, then I'll be the one. How brave is that? How brave is it to get on the bus where you know that you're not supposed to be sitting in this area and it's reserved just for a certain people and you decide, look, I'm tired, it's a seat. It's on the same bus. I'm just sitting down. Huh? And, and uh, uh, let, let, me, let me share this. Uh, we have to learn, boy, this is gonna be tough. We have to learn how to embrace our opposition. Because sometimes it is through opposition the Father gets us the victory. Let me tell you something, that bus driver did exactly what he was supposed to do. He may not have known that he would come down through the annals of time. As a matter of fact, many of you don't even remember his name, do you? That's all right. But he didn't know he would come down through the annals of time, but the fact of the matter is, by him doing what he was supposed to do, Rosa did what she was supposed to do, which brought into play a young Baptist minister by the name of Martin Luther King Jr. And thus, we had a full year of a bus boycott. Most blacks did not ride the bus for a full year. They walked. There was no Uber. <laughs> there was no Uber they could call. They walked miles. I'm looking at people right now. <laughs> Please, I'm getting on this bus. I like the back in the first place. I'm sitting back there because that's where the heat is. I don't care. I'm sitting on this bus. No, no, no. But a full year, I mean, that is astounding to me. That, watch this now, that people got together. Woo! So much happens when people decide to get together and do something. But we don't see that today, do we? Because it's a divide and conquer strategy. We don't march together like we should, huh? You see that footage we showed earlier in Ferguson? Yeah, we don't really do it like they did it back in the day. And there's no leader. There's no one that really says, come together. This is how we'll do it. We'll be peaceful. We'll be nonviolent. Huh? We got to get back to that. Yeah. Uh, 1960, four black students in Greensboro, North Carolina, began a sit-in at a segregated Woolworths lunch counter, resulting in a desegregated establishment six months later. 1964, President Johnson signs the Civil Rights Act. That very same year, uh, Martin Luther King wins the Nobel Peace Prize. However, in 1968, King was assassinated. 1978, affirmative action is upheld by the Supreme Court. It wouldn't last very long. 1983, Guyon Bluford Jr. becomes the first African American in space. Take that, Jetsons. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> 2001, Colin Powell becomes the first African-American U.S. Secretary, Secretary of State. 2005, Condoleezza Rice becomes the first black female U.S. Secretary of State. 2008, Senator Barack Obama becomes the first African-American president. Uh, for those of y'all clapping, y'all do know that he is just as much black as he is white, right? <laughs> History has to repeat it, has to correct it. He is the first mulatto or the first biracial president in the United States. <laughs> we get excited when they just a little sconch of black. Oh, he black, he black, Woo! he black, he black, he black. Look at his hair, he black, he black. <laughs> uh, Oh, man, please do your history and understand, man, oh, Father, please do your history and understand why they call him the first black president. Because there was a, uh, a statute that, that went into place years ago that if a person had just a little bit of black blood in them, they were considered black. And it was racist in its very origin, meaning if you got a little black in you, you ain't no part of us. 
That's why. But the fact of the matter is, he's not the first black president. He's the first biracial president. Now, when I get elected, I'm going to be the first one. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Let me tell you something. <laughs> that will never happen. Because I couldn't get through the debates. What they're doing nowadays, I could never get through the debate. Like, what you say, man? Hold on. What you say? What you say? What you say? What you say? Oh no, you won't bring my wife into this. My wife, what you say, man? My wife, no, hold on, no, stop, hold on. What you say, man? <laughs> oh man, <laughs> you, know, you can have politics, you can have that. You can have that. I like my platform right here. So, so in our history, we see this these vicissitudes, we see this ebb and flow, we see victories and then we see defeats. We, man, it's almost as if the, the, the higher the victory, the lower the defeat that, that we received. It was, it was give and take, you know, it was, um, if you do your history, I, I encourage you all to go home this week and look at um, Black Wall Street in Oklahoma. It was one of the most atrocious crimes perpetrated on the people. Um, and the, the, the town was obliterated. It looked like they had literally dropped bombs on this town. Everything that they had built had been burnt to the ground only because it was reported that a young black man rubbed up against, in a crowded elevator, a young white woman. Not even proven, <laughs> just, I think that happened. And, and there was an entire city of just wealth and just burned to the ground. Today, to this very day, they're still reeling from it. <sighs> this is our America. As of 2010 in America, the average white family has 11 times the net worth of a black family and eight times the net worth of a Latino family. <clears throat> so for much of this beautiful country's existence, too much time has been spent on trying to prove that the Negro was inferior and should not share the same civil and human rights as anyone else. As a matter of fact, it was in 1861, President uh, Alexander Stevens of the Confederate States, <clears throat> he, uh, in his famous speech in Savannah, uh, Georgia, and he, in his attempt to prove that the black man was not uh, <laughs> uh, the same as anyone else, he, he, he used uh, Aristotle's use of a syllogism. I don't know if you know what that is. It, it has a three part, it's a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion. And a syllogism kind of goes like this. It's, um, he, he figured, he, he says it this way, man was made in the image of God. That was his major premise. Minor premise was God, as everybody knows, is not a Negro. <laughs> and, his, my, and his conclusion was, therefore, the Negro is not a man. Fiery speech before hundreds and maybe thousands. And this is what comes out of it. Because our country has been steeped in, has been birthed from this use of humans in a way. I wanted to use that clip earlier, and I, I told David that I wanted to... Um, to put what the world needs now is love, sweet love. And I want to show the dissonance between that song and the footage that you were actually seeing. It didn't go together, did it? Right, you should have been hearing some like, you know, angry music or whatever the case was. But the fact of the matter is, that is what the world needs. The world needs love. Oh man, that's, you know, that's man, that's, no, we need more than that, no, I, I know. But see, you gotta unpack love. You got to unpack it. You got you to, you what, what do you mean love? If I loved my brother, I would not subject him to this behavior. You have to be able to look at me as a black man and say, that's my brother. Huh? I look out in this audience and I see my black wife sitting next to my white pastor. I see a Hispanic family sitting next to a white guy. I see, this is what I see. What I see is kingdom. Oh yeah. 
yes, what I see is kingdom. I see the fulfillment, not of just Dr. King's dream, but long before a utopian dream had come along, it was the will of the Father that all of his children come together and represent the kingdom. Acts 17, 26 says this. Let me, let me, before, before you go, you can leave that up. Um, uh, I want to present to you today uh, the frustration of inertia. Um, and there have been things that have been put in place in our society that purposefully hold people back and cause the advancement of others. In the 1630s, there was something called the Head Right Program, and it was a program that allowed males of households from Europe to come over here and claim 50 acres of land and the tools with which to work the land and training at little to no cost. The Homestead Act of 1862 gives out 240 million acres of virtually free land to predominantly white families. 20 to 40 million direct descendants of those recipients are still living on that property today. The FHA home loan program in the first 30 years of its incorporation lended monies almost solely to low income white families. We're looking at the building of an inertia that would make it almost impossible, almost impossible for people to fight against. Acts 17, 26 says this, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their inhabitation. So the frustration of inertia is Galileo's law of inertia. It's defined as the tendency to do nothing or to remain unchanged, the bureaucratic inertia of government or in physics, it is the property of matter by which it continues in its existing state or rest or uniform form motion in a straight line unless the state is changed by an external force. We as a people have been dealing with that external, or we are the external force and we've been dealing with that inertia. We've been dealing with that inertia. Listen to me good. When I speak about blacks, I'm not just speaking about um, just us as a race. I'm talking about those who were, who were white, those who were Italian, who were Irish, who decided to join in. When you look back at the footage, there were rabbis, there were white folk who were walking right there with King because somebody got smart one day and said, this is crazy. Come on now. As a matter of fact, uh, the story is told uh, at, 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 in, in North Carolina, South Carolina rather, as the boys sat there, they sat there all day and there were some, there were some white students who come down from the college and they said, we want to help you. Man, they were pouring shakes over there. They were punching and beating them and the whole thing. But there were white kids who come down and says, we want to help you protest. It's the children of the civil rights that got the notion, this has got to change. Huh? There were black students who would walk the young white girls home because of the fear of what might happen to them because they decided to take the stand. As a matter of fact, I love this story. Um, uh, uh, as the boys were sitting at the counter, there was a little old white lady who walks up to them and they didn't know what to expect. Like, oh God, here we go. And she tapped one on the shoulder and she says, I love what you boys are doing. Keep up the good work. Come together. Right now, listen, if we don't work together, we will get nothing done. And we must work together. So I want to show you this graph. This, this is interesting. This is American slavery and segregation in America. Right here. From 1619 to 1863, we were slaves. From 1863 to 1957, we had no equal status. From 1957 to 1968, we fought and marched for civil rights. However, from the fall of Martin Luther King, we have been strategically and successfully distracted and been made victims of a divide and conquer campaign. 
We'll talk to you about the effects of overexertion on a culture, overexertion on a culture. Y'all know what that feels like when you work too many hours, uh, when you push it too hard at the gym. Uh, some of you box, you understand what that means. Uh, I used to, um, I used to judge boxers, because I'm a huge boxer, boxing uh, fan, and I used to judge boxers when they started uh, swinging and they would kind of lay on each other. I'd be like, come on, man, this ain't no dance, fight, throw some punches. Until I took up boxing. <laughs> and two minutes into my swing, and I was like, ha, ah, ah, ha, ah. ha, you get so tired of swinging. It's like they call the combinations. Ah, ah, jab, jab, ah, ah. And after a while, it's like, oh, my arms are real heavy because I'm a big dude, right? So my arms get real heavy. And after a while, I'm just going through the most. In my head, I'm really swinging. But after a while, it just looks like this. Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> and and, and, and uh, it's funny. Watch this. It's funny, but I want you to see something. That is exactly what we're seeing when we turn on the news. We are looking at a people trying to fight a fight, but they don't have the precision of their training anymore. So they can't swing and hit the object. So they just thrash wildly. They burn down their own neighborhoods. They pick fight with people who look like the ones who did something they ain't the one. When I saw the footage of the LA riots, I was looking at it, there's actual raw footage that goes on for like hours. Actual raw footage. When they pulled Reginald Denny, I couldn't think of his name. Now. When they pulled Reginald Denny out of that truck, I wept because I saw people who are so misguided pull a man out of a truck who had nothing to do with, the, with what they were supposedly rioting for and they beat him mercilessly. And I wept. I didn't care if he was white. I was a human being. <laughs> you have to pull in your focus and make it laser focus and deal with the issue. What we see on TV is effective. It is not cause. What the media wants to show us, as a matter of fact, I encourage, listen, I'm going to encourage you to do a whole lot of research yourself. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned at this service, there is a documentary called The African Americans, uh, Many Rivers to Cross. It is a six part series. Please watch it, everybody, not just black people. Everybody, you need to watch this. This is an amazing account of, of our history uh, taught by Dr. Henry Gates, Jr. Pretty, pretty, uh, Amazing. And what we realize is that if you don't deal with cause, you will constantly be chasing after the effect. And you might fix effect for a moment, but the cause is still there. And if you don't deal with the cause, so I'm not going to burn down a Little Caesars or <laughs> break into a liquor store. L listen, I did a lot of weeping. Uh, but uh, When I watched the footage of the Ferguson riots and I saw these kids break into a liquor store and walk out of there with armful of snacks and liquor, I got so angry. I was sitting inside of my house and I got so angry because I said, what in the name of God does this have to do with the real purpose of protesting and riots? What? No, listen to me. There has to be a voice in this country that can speak to the people and say, enough is enough. There has to be a voice in this country that can speak up and say, now that doesn't make sense and it has to stop. Because our children are running amok. Our children, not black children, our children are running amok. Bro, Cole, I don't see what the problem is. It's 2016. Oh, yeah? Just two weeks ago, my daughter Kennedy was called the N-word at school, at foreign. <laughs> what? In 2016? And, and, and she and I talked about it because it wasn't the first time. It wasn't the first time. Uh, and so I said, sweetheart, what do you think you need to do about it? And she said, oh, I don't know. And it's frustrating because the human spirit is not designed to build with that type of frustration. 
And so I said, well, next time you hear it, just kind of tell them, hey, you know, I appreciate if you didn't, you know, you know say that. Um, I'm about to unpack something real, real quick here. Um, this is a very, in, this is not a one Sunday type thing, but anyway. Um, uh, so, so she dealt with it the right way. She said, you know, she said, watch that. And the guy said, <laughs> he repeated it. And then she went to him. She said, excuse me. She said, I appreciate if you didn't use the word. And the guy said, you know, okay. And they kind of half-heartedly shook hands. But she was very upset. The assistant principal called me and I come up and met and we kind of dealt with it. <clears throat> One thing I explained to him was that that word is being used in our pop culture. It has become a word used in our pop culture. What am, what am I saying? That little white kids, little black kids, Latino are listening to rap. And rap is replete with that word. Why? Because we, some agree and some don't, we have taken the word and we have reclaimed it and we use it as an adjective, a verb, a noun, and we, you know, as, 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 as an affectionate word, oh, what's up? You know, we, we and, and that's what happens. And so what happens is if your black child got white friends, then they feel like, well, how come I can't say it too? I want to say it because it seems cool. It's like when you said it, it seems real cool. So I want to say it too. It's a, part of this, it's, it's a part of this culture. In that context, it was not used as a part of pop culture. So it still happens in this day. How do we deal with this? It starts with a conversation. We talk and don't talk just in your own home. Encourage, invite somebody into a conversation and say, can we deal with this? Let's talk about this for a second. Let's take the mitts off. Let's take the gloves off. Just... Just let's just do because I don't want to fight. I want to reason in love. Come let us reason together. I want to talk in love. Because when you say I don't see color, see, I got a problem with that too. You got to see my color. No, no, I know what you're saying. You're saying, no, I don't judge you by your color. That's great. But I'm saying, stop saying, I don't, I don't see color. Yes, you do. <laughs> you definitely see my color. You know what I'm saying? I had a conversation with an older um, uh, a white gentleman who, who was gay um, years ago, and he, we were talking, and he was like, you know, he kind of compared gay rights to black rights, and that ruffled my feathers. I'm like, ah, ah, I don't know. <laughs> because, no, I, I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. Because when you walk out the house and you're white and gay, unless you are effeminate, I don't know if you're gay. When I walk out the house, I'm black all day long. <laughs> you got to see my color. You, you see my color? And that's cool, man. We're family. We're family. That's cool. I'm darker. My wife, I always joke that she's part white. <laughs> she's not. <laughs> my kids are like, mommy's part white. She's not. But... <laughs> <laughs> but, but do you know, do you know that there are disparages even between the black? Do you know there are, are dark-skinned blacks who are prejudiced against light-skinned blacks or vice versa? I was just talking to some, a couple Puerto Ricans and they were saying the same thing in there. As a matter of fact, one of them was saying, I'm considered black in my family. I was looking at her like, what? <laughs> then what am I? Good Lord. Right, but, but think about it. There are disparages in every race. As a matter of fact, I don't know if y'all know this, but even in the white race, when we come over as slaves, most whites were indentured servants. But the whites began to look at the slave and say, you know, man, we in this thing together. And all of a sudden, they started thinking the same and coming together. And the powers that be said, no, 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 we can't let this happen. So that's when they began to give them land and they, they developed social stratification. Yes, do your history, people. I ain't judging you because a lot of this stuff I didn't know until last week. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So there was a new feeling. Um, coming in the 60s and the 70s and the feeling and direction of our society had began to change significantly. As a matter of fact, the opposition of the Vietnam War had galvanized a younger emerging generation to protest together, regardless of race and social status for a common cause. There, there was a coming together of cultures 
that were once separated, thus sparking the peace movement. Uh, many people found commonality with the opposition to the um, Vietnam War. There were songs in that era that actually reflected what was going on. Bob Dylan in 1962, he writes, the answer, my friend, is all right. What the world needs now is young bloods get together. Who knows that song? Not that song. Okay. In 1967, Paul McCartney was in Scotland and he was watching uh, the civil unrest in America and he began to write, Blackbird singing in the dead of night, take these broken wings and learn to fly all your life. A white man. This is a white man, not just a white man, but a, a Brit who's looking at it and saying something has got to be done. When we are all concerned about all people, that's when things change. And then in 1972, people all over the world join hands. What? Yeah, you know that song. I don't know. Don't act like you don't know it. So if you got your notes, look at this. A concerted effort gets the job done. A concerted effort gets the job done. Um, the word sacrifice, I, I've taught this before in worship, does not change. The word sacrifice means to give up something important or valued for the sake of others' considerations. To give up something uh, this particular Sunday, uh, all of me, it, it, the, the, the subtopic is love sacrificially. It is to give up something for the consideration of others. And it has to be something that you you know, you, you actually put value into. Uh, John 13 and 34, it's not there, just, but listen to this. A new commandment I give you that you love, agape, one another, even as I have loved you. In your notes, our existence is dependent on us working together. Yes, it is. Our existence is dependent on us working together. Whether you think it is or not, we were all designed to live together. Um, I've been reading this book uh, for a while, and it's by Tom Shadyac. He's actually an American film producer. He, he did movies like um, uh, Bruce Almighty and Nutty Professor, the first Nutty Professor. Um, and on his way home, he was riding a bike, and on his way home, he, he uh, fell off his bike and he had this really bad head injury and for about a year or so he had these excruciating migraines and he just, I mean, it, it, you know, it, he felt suicidal at some point. At any rate, it was during this time that he really just found God. He found just a deeper calling and a deeper sense and it put him on this journey. He says something uh, in his book, I Am, that's just pretty amazing. It says, cooperation is intrinsic, competition is learned. Cooperation is intrinsic. Competition, we teach our kids to compete from a very early age. We have sports, and that's fine, sports and all that kind of stuff, right? But, but when competition causes you to mistreat me, we got an issue. When competition causes me to mistreat you, we got an issue, right? If it's fun competition, let it be what it is. But when it becomes something that causes a race of people or a group of people to be mistreated, it ain't fun no more. So all of me, this series, all of me, uh, I see this from the father's perspective. What he is saying is this. When you all come together, you'll begin to see a much clearer picture of who I am. Has anybody in here ever seen the face of God? Seriously, let me know, because I want to talk to you after service if you have. I want, to know, I want to know what he looks like. You, you've never seen the face of God. This is my theory. I see God when I look out in this audience. I see God when I see Larry Botza, I see John, 
I, I see God when I look out and I see Isai. I see God when I see, I see God. I see God because we are all made from him, so we become this mosaic, you know what I mean? We, we become this, this amalgamation of who God is. He, he makes us all, and when we all cooperate and act right, it looks like God. Do you think there's any chaos in God? Do you think there's any confusion and conflict in God? Do you think God is fighting with himself? Then why do we? Choice. Choice. We all have free will. What do you use your free will to do? All right. Malachi 2.10 says this. Do we not all have one father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously each against his brother so as to profane the covenant of our fathers? In 1871, Charles Darwin writes in his first book on human nature. I know we all got our qualms about um, Darwin, but in actuality, it is through history that it was those who covered Darwin that kind of, you know, didn't really do him justice um, but in his book, The Descent of Man, he uses survival of the fittest two times. Two times. He uses the word love 95 times. But for some reason, it's only attributed to survival of the fittest. And then you can extrapolate from there, right? No, he uses love 95 times. It is often used, the word often spoken, but seldomly used, seldomly shown. What is it to love someone who's not from my neighborhood, who's from the other side of the tracks? What is it to love that neighbor? As a matter of fact, Tom Shadyac's father, he and Danny Thomas are responsible for St. Jude's Hospital. It is St. Jude's Hospital that does not discriminate against wealth or poverty. They treat for free children with cancer. They don't ask about tax returns. They don't ask about uh, political affiliations. They simply treat these little dying kids. Hopefully they can have life. And he said this. He said this. He says, there's a little church that I go to down here. He says, and it's amazing. He says, they have worship. They have the kiss of peace. He says, all for one an hour and a half. He says, and I sit there and I watch Latino, black, and white families. He says, but they go out into the parking lot and it's over until the next Sunday. <laughs> Here this man who helped build this, this facility to, to treat people and he gets it sometimes better than, than, than we right here in the church do. Darwin goes on to say this, say this, that unlike our primate counterparts, we have been endowed with the strongest instinct known to man, which is the sympathy and the ability to cooperate. We have within us this thing called mirror neurons. Mirror neurons. It allows us to be empathetic with others. In other words, when we see someone suffering, we feel it too. Have you ever been watching YouTube and you see a kid on a skateboard and he's coming down and he splits the rail? Boom! And every man in here is like, oh! Ugh. You ever seen somebody walking up the stairs and they trip and you go, oh, you kind of feel it? That's attributed to mirror neurons. That is within us. We are all built with that, right? When something happens with someone else, you feel it too, right? If you see someone about to poke something in your eye and it gets real close, you just, yeah, right? Because you get, you get a sense of what's about to happen. Let me ask you a question. What happens to that thing when you see a race being mistreated? It doesn't go away. The mirror neurons are still there. But what happens to it? Huh? What happens when you see a disabled child being taunted and teased? He or she didn't have anything to do with the position they're in, the condition they're in. What happens when you drive by a homeless person? Well, I can't help them all. Yeah, but you can help one. It's another thing we have. This body is pretty amazing. It's called the vagus nerve. 
And it is an amazing bundle of nerves located within us that make us feel that rush of emotions or our chest expands and tears fill our eyes. If you were to see a, a father who comes home from the service and he goes into a classroom and surprises his little boy and the little boy runs up, jumps in his arms and just begins to cry. Something happens within us, that elation, that chest begins to expand with that sympathy. You feel it as well. And the only thing that's been proven to cut that off is anger. It disconnects. Something happens and it disconnects. If you were to watch our servicemen who rushed into the Trade Towers on 9-11, those brave men who rushed in while everybody else was running out. If you look at our guys overseas and who are fighting in wars and they run toward the thing while everybody else is running away, there's something inside of you that just says, man, that patriotism or just that human side of you just says, man, I want to I, I do that too. What happens to that? When we look at what's happening on the news, when we look at racism, because let me tell you something about racism. Racism used to be in your face. And right after the Civil uh, 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 Rights Act, when after all of that, the marching, racism just got smart and it put on a suit. It got real smart. It's no longer spitting in your face and hosing you down with, with holes and sticking the dogs on you. It just got smart. Because, see, if I can hide, if racism can hide from you, then you don't know what to attack, what to deal with. And that causes frustration. You ever walk in your house and you smell something rancid? You walk through that entire house trying to figure out what that is. What is that? What? What is? And you look under the bed, you look in here, you look under the couch. What is going on? Why? Because you cannot pinpoint the problem. And that is what you're beginning to see. That is what you have been seeing, rather, is a people who are frustrated because they, see, you don't know when it's racism nowadays. That's what makes it so, you just got turned down. You're going, was that racism? <laughs> no, it's frustrating. It's like, you know, no, well, well, your child didn't make it this time. You go, okay, wait a minute. Is that racism? You didn't get the apartment. You go, and, and that's what's so frustrating because some of it ain't racism. Right? And some of it is, so you don't know what it is. But the only thing that deals with racism and prejudice and hatred is love. No, come on, it's love. It is the agape love. It's philos, it is the love for your brother. It is the love that the father shared, talking about somebody rejected and despised. Jesus went through it all. Whoa, and they looked down on him. He came for his own people, and his own people rejected him. But he showed love. Love is going to change everything. I want the choir to help me with this. If you can come on up. G.K. Chesterton, the writer, poet, and Christian Apologist said this when asked by the London Times for an essay titled, What's Wrong with the World? He simply replied, Dear Sirs, I am. Until we look within and realize that we may be the problem, nothing will change. So last note is this, the Father desires to have all of us cooperate so that all of him can be manifested in the earth, the Father is saying, all of me. I need all of you to cooperate so the world can see all of me. This last thing, Romans 8, 19, says this, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. I want you to watch this. When we look at modern man, we have to face the fact that modern man suffers from a kind of poverty of the spirit. 
which stands in glaring contrast to his scientific and technological abundance. We've learned to fly the air like birds. We've learned to swim the seas like fish. And yet we haven't learned to walk the earth as brothers and sisters. <laughs>